Now, uh, there's one thing that we cannot really have a startup without. We can have a very wonderful team. We can have a very mindful relationship with our team members. We can be very mindful about our family. Um, but if you build a product and your product doesn't scale and your product doesn't grow, uh, there's very little point of doing a startup. So um, a wonderful investor, American investor from Norway, a good friend of mine, Sean Percival, please come on stage and tell about us how to grow uh, a startup. He's, he's going to talk about digital marketing, right, Sean? Yep, you got it. All right. All so right, thank you. That's, that's a really, really cool topic, so hopefully you can gain some knowledge here. Yes, and I'm sorry, I've lost my voice a little bit. Uh, turns out if you drink heavily and karaoke all night, it has an impact on your voice. It was worth it. Uh, all right, let's see. So really quick, I'm an American, so I have to talk about myself for about 20 minutes. If we have time, we'll get to the rest. Uh, by the way, thank you for not booing when I said I was American. I just never know these days with Trump and everything. Uh, but right now, I am an American. I live in Oslo, Norway, of all places, you know, for the nice weather. And before that, I was actually working with 500 startups. And during my time there, I invested in about 100 companies with them. I also helped run accelerator programs. And the big thing about 500 startups was we really focused on growth, how to get you from product market fit to the next stage of your business. Today, I'm working in Oslo, as I mentioned. I'm working at the Catapult Accelerator, which is actually a social impact, social good accelerator. So if there's any businesses out here that are doing something good in the world, societal or environmental impact, would love to talk to you. Please come see me after the talk. Um, I was vice president of a little website called MySpace. Does anyone remember MySpace? Yeah? You guys look old enough to remember MySpace. Maybe MySpace is still big in Latvia. I don't know. Uh, also on Twitter if you want to follow me or heckle me or get more bad jokes. Um, let's start really quick, though, and say that actually when it comes to marketing, most people suck at marketing. Like, this is totally normal. I meet very few founders who are exceptionally good, technical skills and all this good stuff, also being good marketers. The reality is most people are not. Marketing is not a strong suit for many people. It's hard to get out there and sort of drag people to your product and website to tell them it's the best. It's even harder, in my experience, here in the Nordics and the Baltics, everyone's just too damn modest here in these countries. Marketing is not about being modest, so there's some challenges. Uh, let's start with some really kind of quick general pro tips to get us started. Most importantly, you're probably going to need to try 10 different things to find one thing that works. This is where I see a lot of people fail when it comes to growth marketing. They have one idea, they put all their time and energy into it, they spend months and months and months on a marketing campaign, they launch it, and then womp womp, nothing happens, and they have to go start over again. So it's really important that you get in this very fast iteration cycle of trying many different things. Please think of marketing like a concert. You have many different instruments that are all working together. It's not one single instrument that gets you the growth. Um, if you have a website, especially, a little bit different for mobile apps, but for websites, especially e-commerce, certain other businesses, 98% of the people that engage with your product are not going to convert. They're not going to do what you want them to do. They're not going to sign up. They're not going to buy something. They're not going to join the subscription, whatever it might be. So just really think about that. The majority of people, the mass majority, are not going to do what you want them to do. So it's your job to bring them back any way you can, and you have to be super aggressive about this. Most people throw a lot of traffic at a website. Oh, what happened? It didn't work? OK, I guess let's start over and throw another bunch of traffic at it. It's not the way to do it. Whatever traffic you get, especially in the early stage, you need to maximize the conversion, maximize your engagement with them. I should say, too, a lot of things I'll talk about today are for very early stage companies. It's sort of getting the beginning of product market fit or product market fit into the next stage. Uh, marketing itself, though, is really about moving emotions. So these are some of my favorite, desire and greed, of course, I'm American. Nostalgia, FOMO, fear of missing out. So if you see like really good marketing campaigns, they tend to hit on these different things. FOMO, fear of missing out, is sort of the lifeblood of Silicon Valley. It what drives most investment decisions and a lot of the ways we do business. But if you think about some of the marketing messages you get, they always say things like, you know, 200 of the top Fortune 500 companies are using this product. So they try and use the validation of other people, that people have an advantage if they're using your product, your service. Greed, by the way, it's not just your greed, you know, you making more money. It's also helping your customers and users make more money as well, too. Uh, but these are really the key. What is the secret to going viral online? What is the secret to having a great commercial? You're moving one or two of these emotions. That's how you connect with people. 
Knowing your stuff with regard to marketing, or at least acting like you do, that is the secret to fundraising. There are two different kinds of pitches in the world. There's a vision pitch and a traction pitch. What do you think gets funded more often? So your ability to understand what it takes to grow the business and your ability to articulate those numbers to investors, this is what we invest in. So if we see a business is starting to work, that's exactly what we want to put our money in, help it grow further. If you can't show me that you have traction, you have momentum, it's going to be a very hard decision to make that investment. Uh, and then finally, it's a personal pet peeve, but please don't say things like, we did this with no marketing. A lot of people think this is like a positive thing, and it's absolutely not. Basically, yes, oh, thank you. Basically what you're saying is like, I don't know, something worked, we have no idea what it was, and we have no idea how to repeat it. It's not how you scale a business. Same thing on the virality, we're gonna make a viral video, we're totally gonna go viral. That basically never happens. The one example I've seen it happen is Dollar Shave Club, if you've seen that. And I actually worked with that company early on. And I remember he showed us the video and we laughed a little bit. We thought it was funny. We're like, yeah, it'll get a few views. Um, that video, when he launched, I think they had 13,000 orders in the first few minutes of that thing going live. It actually got so many orders, the website completely melted and they lost a lot of the traffic too. It's one of the few times I've seen a business built on a viral video. It just doesn't happen very often. I think the key was humor, touching on emotions, and sort of showing that your product is better. They did a really good job of saying like, the old way sucks, the new way is good. The old guys are bad, this is the way to do it. Uh, before we talk about how to grow the business, let's talk about a few ways how not to grow the business. Um, first, getting out and meeting with investors before you know what it takes. A lot of people spend a lot of time and energy. You have to understand, like, as investors, it's our job to be nice to you. We have to be nice to you. We don't know if you're going to be doing something amazing in six months. So we will take a lot of meetings, we'll waste your time, we'll collect information. And with the problem with this, that means you're wasting time not growing the business. So VCs are usually pretty eager to meet you. They want to kind of see where you are. They'll put you in a database, and then they'll think about you again in six months. So do not go out to market until you're ready, and you can show these investors, listen, I found a few things at work. I need that money now to grow the business further. Investors do not want you learning on their money. We actually want you learning on the last investor's money. <laughs> That's sort of the secret. But we don't want to give you money so you can learn and test. You, know, you need to be testing before you get to meet with us. Um, this is a big problem in the Nordics. I don't know if it is in the Baltics, but staying in beta for way, way too long. I can tell you that word beta is almost extinct in Silicon Valley. We just don't use it anymore. Because beta, what does that do? That signals that like, you're early, you're still kind of figuring it out. A lot of founders I meet, they're like, yeah, we're in beta. I'm like, yeah, my check is in beta as well. Like, until you get out, launch the damn thing, get some numbers too. So don't be shy, get out there, push it out, learn fast and iterate. Uh, yes, the classic disruptor thought leader. Having too much coffee with thought leaders and disruptors, not gonna grow the business. You need to be at home cranking on numbers, experimenting and testing. Um, designing a totally kick-ass logo and startup swag probably not going to grow the business. Can't think of one example when this has happened. If you're spending hundreds of euros on startup swag, that could be a handful of customers that you buy. Don't waste your money. Uh, and then finally, of course, listening to conference speakers who claim they have all the answers. None of you should be here right now. You should all be at home working on your business, growing your business, sorry. <laughs> uh, but let's talk about now how you actually do grow the business. And let's start on the top there, where we talk about finding levers. This is really, really the secret. You have to find out what makes your users stick, what makes them convert. Typically, it's a few different things. It could be something as simple as if we call someone within two hours of a lead generation, we can close them. If it's some type of network, like a marketplace, it's simple things like if the user adds a photo, creates a listing within seven days, and does this other action, we know we have them hooked. So you really need to figure this out. It's a little bit of qualitative and quantitative analysis as you're looking at these things. Find the two or three triggers that they are and just zero in on those. Put all the time and effort into forcing people to do these actions. Um, the other part is setting goals or OKRs. If you don't know, OKRs are it's sort of a framework by Google. Helps you sort of say what you're gonna be doing the next week or the next quarter. This is super important and this is actually what we really force our companies to do in an accelerator. We hold them accountable, we make them set goals. When they don't hit the goals, we beat them up a little bit, and then we help them adjust and figure out too. But if you don't hold yourself accountable, you're just gonna kinda sit and drift. You need to put a number down on a piece of paper, and I'll actually show you how we track this. You'll be shocked like how simple and amazing it is. But you have to put these goals down, 
could be signups, could be revenue, could be whatever your main KPIs are. Just writing them down, sharing it with the team, it makes you accountable. It'll make you be more focused on that. So next, we're exploring data. We're thinking about different ways that we can find people. We've done some surveys. We've looked at some of our analytics. We're starting to pick things out, starting to understand the users. And now we get into the next step, which is brainstorming. And basically, what we do is work with companies and have them list literally 50 to 100 ideas that they want to try. Now, that seems like too much, but it's basically every idea. You just want to jam it in there, put it on a list, and then the next step, you start to prioritize. Think about which ones you think are going to have the biggest impact and the fastest impact for you. Um, beyond that, so now we're testing. Now, we also talked about this idea of like getting out fast and iterating. This is what's important, is that you test these things as fast as you can. You should be able to run a test within a week. You shouldn't have to build anything to run a test. And I'll show you in a second what I mean by that, too. But this is a challenge when you have product people, when you have people that are just too much, they're design nerds, and they want to design the hell out of everything. It takes months to launch a new idea, to launch a new campaign. It's not how you do it in the early stage. Um, we're going to implement next, so we're going to go through the basically quickest and fastest, dirtiest way we can do it. Once again, should be able to do this in a week. And in some cases, ideally, you can do this without developers. So for you guys that are not technical, I'm sorry for the engineers. Like, engineers are not passionate about marketing. Engineers are passionate about like, building stuff and tweaking and setting up all this junk. You know? And I've met with engineers before, and I love it when they're like, yeah, we built infrastructure that scales to a million users and da, da, da. And I go, how many users do you have? And they're like, we have 12. Well, it's like, well, why did you spend three months building this massive infrastructure when you don't have the users there yet? So you as founders, you really need to figure out, how can I do things without the developers? And I'll talk about that as well, too. So we run these tests, we experiment, we learn, we analyze. At that point is when we actually make it a real product. We integrate it into the product, we integrate it into the sign-up flow, we change the messaging, whatever it is. But we've tested it as fast as we could in a very lightweight framework before we got the developers doing their cycles and delaying and delaying and delaying. Um, this is what I mentioned, actually, and this seems really dumb and stupid and simple, but this is what we do with our accelerator companies. Week over week, we want them to set a goal, and every single week, they get up on stage or up in front of the entire batch, and they talk about what happened. This is like a real example. It's an education company, and as you can see, most of the times, they were actually hitting their numbers. They had one or two bad week there, but the month, they got very, very close. So once again, it's this accountability. Notice this is not a complicated dashboard. It's not mixed panel, Google Analytics, and all this stuff. You're going to use that. But making it very simple like this, forcing yourself to type in these numbers every time, one, it forces you to figure out where is this data? How do I easily extract it? The numbers start to get burned in your head, and you start to really be more focused in on it, too. So this has been super effective. You do need all these analytics and all the fancy stuff as well, too. But really, what you just need is something so drop-dead simple Putting in the numbers will actually really, really help you. Uh, next, OK, uh, just a few techniques and different things that you can do. So lead gen, using sort of lead generation pages, definitely the best and fastest way to get information, to get email addresses, to help people sort of learn who you are. Um, I recommend Unbounce. So Unbounce is a very simple landing page platform. You can set up anything. It doesn't matter if you're the worst designer in the world. You can make a beautiful landing page. It's about $80 a month. It's incredibly cheap for a mechanism to drive growth in your business. What we're also doing is we're testing messaging. We're testing pricing. We're figuring out things as fast as we can before we bring it into the site. Unbounce does built-in A-B testing. So this is also great. Like You and your co-founder disagree on something. They're like, oh, no, this should be pink and this should be blue. You know, the best way to figure that out is basically run it in a test. And then you can go to them and be like, look, the data doesn't lie. We're pink. And you switch the whole damn thing to pink. Um, use paid traffic to get data faster. It's one challenge with landing pages. You need about 1,000 visitors to actually get data that's significant. So you want to figure out how we can quickly get that data there in a week or get that traffic there in a week. Uh, and then the final piece, too, is offering a carrot. You, know, you dangle a carrot out in front of them, too. Um, a lot of people be like, but I, I do lead gen. I have a little box that says, get my newsletter. Nobody wants your newsletter, I'm sorry to say. Your newsletter is like, yeah, I'm going to spam you with junk. It's not a strong call to action. So you're giving them like a white paper, comparison guide, free consultation, erotic massage. What the hell? I don't know. But whatever it takes, basically, is the point. You want to offer them anything you can to get them to give you that email address. Email address is still the most effective channel. People think like, oh, email doesn't work, and I get too much spam. It, yeah, it still is. 
I love Latvia, they just challenge you. I like this. You guys are aggressive. Oh. Messenger too. Yeah, there is Messenger I think is emerging as well too. E-commerce especially though, transactional, email still does the best. Next step, retargeting. This is like such a simple thing to do and very few companies do it. You've all been victims of retargeting. You've gone and seen a product somewhere and then all of a sudden that damn thing is following you around the internet. It's so super drop dead simple to set up. Um, when I did my last startup, actually retargeting was a new concept. And I remember I was fundraising, I was on Sand Hill Road, which is where all the VCs live. And I met with this guy and he was like, yeah, yeah, I checked out your website last week and I've been seeing all these ads on the New York Times and like, that's amazing, how do you do that? And of course my response is like, we're just really good at online marketing. Uh, but the reality was I took two minutes to set up a pixel, I took five, 10 minutes to set up some banner ads and then we're on the New York Times. So retargeting, I recommend AdRoll, so A-D-R-O-L-L. -L. There's other ways to do this, of course. There's many different providers. If this is something new to you, if you're not super experienced, if you want a very simple solution, AdRoll is the way to do it. What I like about them, too, is they do Facebook and banner ads. So if you do Facebook retargeting, you use their pixel, you're only on Facebook. If you do Google retargeting, you're only in banner ads. AdRoll lets you be on both. Uh, I'd recommend like putting the pixel on today and basically, because you want to start tracking these people as soon as you can. It's not retroactive. You can't go back and find people that visited your site months ago. You want to start collecting these people, collecting these audiences, and then once, before you know it, you have 1,000 people. Then you have actually something to work with. Uh, and it is good for branding. Like Most of you are like baby startups. Nobody knows who you are, nobody cares. I'm not trying to be mean, just trying to be real. So what happens is like when you use stuff like this, it makes you appear bigger. It makes you have a larger presence. In the world of marketing, perception is reality. So this can give you a much bigger boost. It can remind people that you exist. This is a very noisy world. It's very, very distracting. If you have a new service, especially if you're in a competitive market, you're going to have to constantly be reminding people that you exist and to come back. And it also works for B2B. If you have a very long purchase cycle, if it takes people six to 12 months to make this decision, you want to be in front of their face as much as you can. Do you have any arguments for that? No. OK, good. Uh, social media, like, yeah, we all love social media. It's mostly for fun. It's not really a great way to grow your business, especially with the organic side. So it's a bit of a vanity metric. Please, if an investor says, what are your KPIs, and you're like, I got 10,000 Facebook likes, like, that's not a real metric. It's probably not going to grow your business. As you've probably seen, Facebook keeps taking away the organic value of these pages. It's like every few months, it's like, oh, you get less organic traffic. Can you pay us, please? So when I talk about social media, I mostly mean the organic side. Doesn't typically move the business. Platforms like Twitter, you notice you don't see transactional businesses advertising on there. It's because it just doesn't work. People are like, you know, looking at news, looking at funny jokes, hate reading Donald Trump's tweets. Like people are not in the transactional mode when they're on Twitter. Um, does help you build some trust and legitimacy. It does look a little bit weird if you're researching a company and they have no activity and they haven't updated in six months. So I would do it just for the sake of needing to do it. It is probably not going to be a major driver of your business. Um, SEO is actually where I got started. Uh, and it's mostly because I built an e-commerce site. I was dirt poor. I had no way to sort of buy marketing. So I figured, well, I'll just trick Google into sending me traffic. Um, but same thing with Google. Like Google is God. You know, Google giveth and taketh away. Uh, and they've been taking a lot away from SEO, mostly because of people like me. Like we take advantage of these systems. And the other thing, of course, social, paid social media traffic has become a much bigger driver for these people. So, and they've also taken away a lot of data. So we get less than half of the data we used to get about SEO. Um, they basically don't want bad actors. They don't want you manipulating the system. So when you do SEO, like number one is you do want to cover the basics. Number one, make sure Google can read your site. And that seems like a very simple, stupid thing. But developers tend to get very fancy. They do things in Angular and all this other stuff. Looks beautiful, looks great on my iPhone and all these other places. Google can't read the damn thing. Um, now, where Google has taken away, they have given us a little bit more resources. Uh, it used to be called Webmaster Tools. Now I believe they call it Search Console. There's tons of information in there, totally free. They tell you good things, bad things. They let you render the site so you can actually see how Google sees the site. Most people set that up or they sometimes don't. They never look at it. I can tell you what I'm doing SEO. I look at that thing every single week. Are there any errors? Are they, is the index increasing? They will even tell you your average position of where you rank in Google as well, too. It's simple. Final piece on this, too, start to think about niches that you can own, small keyword terms that are not so competitive. 
and zero in on those. Now remember, people search differently today. So they actually type very long strings, almost like natural language, almost like you're asking a question. You know, in the 90s or early 2000s, we typically type very short or one word things. Now it's changed and Google has adjusted to this. So you can usually typically find some type of phrase, three to five words, highly relevant to your business. This will be especially great because these people that are searching, they have really, really high intent. They're really looking for this type of solution that you might be providing. If they're on social media, like there's a lot of distractions. You know, it's like, oh, my friends are on vacation. Oh, that person I'm really attracted to is in a bikini, and you have to like be distracted and watch that. You know, so it's hard to take someone away from that type of experience and move them into a funnel or a sign-up page. On SEO and Google, though, the intent is very high. So you want to try and own these niches. And how do you do that? You discover what they are. You use tools like moz.com, moz.com do the research, build content, build links, and then whenever you start to get any traction in search, you just keep doubling down on that. So if Google rewards you in some kind of search term, you just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper on that. It's very hard to start from zero and get ranking. If you get a little bit of ranking on something, it's much easier just to kind of improve that the best that you can. Um, good, okay, almost on time too. Final pitfalls to avoid. Acquiring bad users, bad customers. I have done this myself, and it's very, very painful. These are people that you give out too many discounts to. They're not the right audience. Like, basically what happens is they churn. They're kind of nasty to deal with. They're high overhead on customer service. They may leave bad reviews. So do not be acquiring users just for the sake of acquiring users. A good example of this is, like, why do you think Groupon didn't work out? Every new user that Groupon sent to a company was typically a bad user. They walked in there once, they got the deal, they had a discount, they never went back again. So it's a loss for the company. Um, high overhead, low yield partnerships. So what I mean by this is basically a lot of like, I see two startups that are partnering up together, usually a bad idea. Like what is zero times zero? It's still zero. You know, you guys are like tiny little companies, you're not gonna be able to add much value. The other example is the corporates are all trying to seduce you. They're here, they're everywhere, they're in love with you, they're worried about being disrupted, they offer you weird things. You know, we're gonna email you to 100,000 customers are gonna email your message right to them. And as a startup, you're like, wow, 100,000 people, that's amazing. But what you don't think about, and then you, they're like, okay, we just need you to build these five things and do this and change this color to blue and do all these different things. So you, you put all this time and effort into it, they mail 100,000 people, only 10% open it, okay, now we're down to 10,000. Only one to 2% actually click, okay, now we're down to one to 2,000. So don't be like seduced by these like huge partnerships where they really probably need you more than they need them, especially if you put a lot of time into it. Uh, pricey PR, and I, I know that Shira's up next, so I have to be careful, she doesn't get mad at me for talking about this, but basically what I wanna say is that when you're an early stage company and you have limited money, you probably need to do your own PR. Really good PR agencies are sometimes in the range of five to $10,000 a month. And they do, yeah, that's cheap, she says. So like a good PR agency is gonna cost you this much money, they're gonna take two or three months to really get going, and now you've spent a lot of money. And if you're very sort of cash poor, that money could probably better be spent on online marketing. So save the PR until you get to a point where revenue is high or you've done a large round. Then you bring in these, these PR folks. They can really help you get the press that you need. In the very, very early days, the onus is on you. You have to learn how to get press. I can tell you the biggest secret, especially in the tech world, is you basically just find the most junior people at these different tech publications, and you become their friends. And you get to know them. The media world moves very, very fast. Today's junior guy or girl is like literally an editor in a, in a year or so. And they can actually follow you on this journey. You know, but I see a lot of people, they like email the editor of TechCrunch and like, oh, they didn't write back. And it's like, of course they didn't. Like they're busy like running this whole damn thing. You know, they don't actually write articles. So you start with the junior people, get to know them. If you get press, typically they'll write about you again. Every time you have something meaning meaningful to share, you have a new update, you raise money. So you kind of build these relationships stronger. I'm sure, we'll talk a lot more about that after this. Uh, and then finally, I'm almost on time and I'll just leave you with this last note. The biggest mistake, the biggest pitfall you can make is waiting to start marketing. It's never too soon to be building up audience, building up information, building data, and building those email addresses that do work and do convert really well. So please don't wait to start. Get out there, don't be shy, be aggressive, and good luck to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>